We have two sponsors today. First up is Retrofret Vintage Guitars in New York City. They were featured back in the Fretboard Journal number 18, as you may remember. And for good reason, Retrofret has over 300 vintage acoustic and electric instruments in their Brooklyn showroom, including guitars, basses, banjos, mandolins, amps, and more. I already told you about the 58 Strat they have and Dave Dudley's 52 Gibson J200. They just sent out a new arrival email newsletter, and I saw they landed a 37 Gibson Advanced Jumbo and a 1937 Stahl Solo Style 7. That's built by the Larson Brothers, of course. Beyond that, Retrofred has been known for their top-notch repairs and restorations over the many years they've been in business. Check out their inventory on retro- at retrofret.com and be sure to follow their Instagram account for the latest. <laughs> Welcome to the Fretboard Journal Podcast. I'm your host, Jason Verlindi, the publisher of the Fretboard Journal Magazine. And today we are talking to guitarist Chris Shiflett. Yes, I am interviewing a Foo Fighter on our little Fretboard Journal Podcast. Uh, I can't believe it. Uh, Beyond playing guitar for the Foo Fighters, Chris just is an incredibly cool guy. He hosts his own podcast called Walk in the Floor, where he's interviewed everyone from Sarah DeRose and Marty Stewart to Red Simpson and Merle Haggard. If you are a Fretboard Journal reader, you should definitely subscribe to that podcast because he's got a lot of our favorite artists on it. He's also got an incredible solo career that, as you will hear in our conversation, is deeply rooted in classic country. So totally up our alley. Uh, I had a great time hanging out with him. We shot a video of him that is now on our site as well as our YouTube channel. Check that out, and I hope you like our interview. Chris's podcast is called Walking the Floor. I want to give a quick shout-out to a couple of other podcasts that I am digging right now. First up, obviously, is the other Fretboard Journal podcast right now, Luthier on Luthier with Michael Bashkin. This month, Michael is interviewing Laurent Brondel. That is a great interview that you should definitely seek out. I keep digging Eric Dawes Fret Files podcast as well. It's basically car talk for guitarists. Every month I listen, I learn about something new. Like, did you know that those plug-in air fresheners that you can buy at the drugstore can melt the finish off an acoustic guitar? I had no idea, but this month somebody emailed Eric with that exact problem. So there you go. I'm also digging uh, the Make Moves podcast by John Hammond. John has written for our magazine in the past. He did the Irvin Samoji story for us. Um, He's interviewed me on that podcast, but even if he hadn't, it's a cool listen. Uh, He did a two-part interview with Anthony Wilson that I thought was super, super insightful. If you have not subscribed to the Fretboard Journal print magazine yet, what are you waiting for? You really should. I'm going to give you an added incentive right now. If you go to fretboardjournal.com and use the coupon code PODCAST when you check out, you will save an extra $5 off any order. You could get a whole year of Fretboard Journals for just $35 shipped to your door. You could get discounted back issues or t-shirts, whatever you like that we sell. As a reader-supported magazine, we do appreciate your business and all of those subscriptions really, truly matter to us. Our 39th issue is in production right now. If you subscribe today, you'll get it next Next month when it comes out and uh, while you're on our site I'm going to give a plug to one article that we have going right now you should go to the bench press interview we just did with Frankie Montoro Frankie gets mentioned in our magazine all the time he worked with Wilco he built a guitar for Nils Klein um, he's just a great guy and right now you know a lot of builders we talk to have kind of OCD tendencies and that is what makes all these guitars so amazing But Frankie's kind of stepping it up a notch with his bench copy line. He's replicating specific vintage Martin guitars from the 30s, like a specific guitar he will just replicate to a T. Um, He's doing, I mean, he's doing all the usual stuff like hide glue, but then he's also making his own tuners and making his own cases for these. He's got some secret sauce wood that he's not really spilling the beans on that looks exactly like Brazilian, but apparently isn't. Uh, Go read up on that. It's a fascinating article, and Frankie's a great guy. Other housekeeping, I know you want to hear this interview. Uh, The Fretboard Journal will be at the Artisan Guitar Show this coming weekend. That's in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. Our own John Thomas will be there moderating a panel with some of the luthiers there. We will also have Fretboard Journals on site. And we will, of course, be at next month's LeConner Guitar Festival, which we are proudly sponsoring. That's May 12th through 14th. This is going to be a fun one, a weekend in our own little Seattle backyard with 40 or so great builders from around the country. LeConnor is an incredibly cool little Pacific Northwest town, and uh, there's going to be some great music, some great guitars on display. The Fretboard Journal is throwing a little party on Friday, May 12th. Reach out to me if you want info on that, and uh, I, I look forward to meeting some of you guys there. 
Our second sponsor for the podcast is Dying Breed Music. If you are into vintage acoustic guitars, you need to bookmark Dying Breed's inventory page on G-Bass as they keep getting great instruments in their store. Lane over at Dying Breed currently has a bourgeois country boy deluxe that was formerly owned by and played by, wait for it, Ricky Skaggs. He also has an extremely rare 1938 Bronson Jumbo Honolulu Master, which sports, in my opinion, one of the coolest headstocks around. Go check that thing out. It is very, very neat. I'm guessing it was made by Regal, but it is uh, not your typical Regal. Beyond that, Dying Breed has a 41D18, a 46D18, and a lot more classics. I know Lane is taking consignment, so if you have something cool that you want to sell, give him a call at 870-818-3434, and he can walk you through the whole process. You can see his whole inventory at dyingbreedmusic.com or by searching for Dying Breed on GBase. All right, without further ado, here is my chat with Chris Shiflett. His new album is called West Coast Town, and it is truly the real deal. Uh, you should go check it out uh, on iTunes or Spotify or wherever you hear music. Uh, I enjoyed it a lot, and I'm, I'm still listening to it, so uh, check it out. Chris, thanks for being on the Fretboard Journal podcast. Thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. I have all sorts of questions about your new record, but uh, let's go back a bit. Did You grew up in Santa Barbara? I did. Yeah, so yeah what, born and raised. What part? Um, well, I mean, when I was like really young, I could think when I was born, my dad was, he was probably done with school by then, but he was teaching. Okay. Um, I, and I think at that time he was teaching at UCSB. So we lived somewhere out in Goleta, uh-huh. but most of my life, like we kind of bopped around a little bit, like back and forth between Santa Barbara and Maryland actually. Cause my dad was teaching out there and then my parents got divorced and then they sort of played back and forth with the child custody for a few years. <laughs> okay. And yeah. then when I was about like six, um, I moved back to Santa Barbara for good. And I will always remember that because it was the day after Elvis died. Wow. In 1977. Yeah. Right. So, um, and every, I remember all the housewives on our street in, um, in Maryland were crying. Yeah. And then the next day we left. And then from that point forward, I, I grew up mostly um, until junior high, like on the east side of Santa Barbara. And then, and then we moved over to the west side. Okay. But most like downtown. I was yeah. like downtown. So that's kind of a, interesting place to grow up were you like a surf rat or skateboarder you know i kicked myself because i didn't surf growing up at all i mean i was a beach kid i was definitely a beach rat but um i'm ashamed to say i was more of a boogie boarder (laughs) at that time (laughs) i didn't get into surfing till my 20s man i wasted all those years when i could have been out there at rincon or whatever but i wasn't but um i made up for lost time but yeah now i skateboarded and you know it was like california in the Mm -hmm. 70s and 80s it was just kind of what you did i i i the only i played soccer you know like ayso um till i was like basically till i started it's funny looking back i never thought about this i you know you don't think about these kind of things when you're a kid but i sort of had like normal kid life until i started playing guitar when i was 11 (laughs) and then i just sort of quit everything else yeah and so all through like you know junior high and high school like i didn't all I cared about was music, mm-hmm. you know what I mean? I just was, was into that. And what was that 11-year-old moment when you uh, took up the guitar? I mean, God, there are so many. You know, in those days, that was like the early 80s. That was the era of Shred. Yeah. You know, that was post-Eddie Van Halen, post-Randy Rhodes, um, you know, coming into Ingve Malmsteen mm-hmm. and people like that. You know, I was like, we were a uh, classic rock family. And then, you know, when all that heavy metal stuff started to happen, we were just jumped head first into that okay. and, and you know ace fraley i gotta say ace fraley because that was you know he was like i think the first um guitar hero you know that yeah. i ever had yeah yeah so you're totally self-taught or were you taking lessons no or? i took a lot of lessons growing up it's, yeah. it's funny and, and i was a terrible terrible guitar student i'm a much better student of guitar now <laughs> sure. you know I, I have the patience for it but when you're a kid it's like you, you don't understand why you need to learn what you need to learn. Mm-hmm. And luckily I had a couple of teachers that, that taught me some good stuff. One in particular, um, my very first teacher, um, made me learn Beatles songs, you know, made me learn all my root chords, made me learn like a couple of scales, you know, yeah. and all that stuff that at the time I was like, this doesn't sound like Ozzy. This is lame, <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you look back and you're like, Oh, thank God somebody gave me that foundation, yeah. you know? And then I went through that phase. Like, you know, I don't know if you remember or if you were into it at that time, but like, um, you know, guys like Randy Rhodes and and uh, and Ingrid Malmsteen and Richie Blackmore and people like that, they're sure. always talking about how much they love classical music. Sure. So I thought like, oh, I got to take classical <laughs> guitar lessons so I can go like, 
you know. And so I took classical guitar lessons, and I, it was so hard, and I just didn't get it. You yeah, know? I, I yeah. couldn't connect. Like, what the fuck does this have to do with thing they announced it? Like, I didn't <laughs> couldn't exactly. put that together, you yeah. know. And luckily for me, you know, there was like kind of a, a big shift in rock and roll happened. Mm-hmm. Right, it, you know, it was right about the end of junior high for me. Okay, is when the glam rock stuff started bubbling up. Okay, you know. Um, and I discovered a band called Hanoi Rocks mm-hmm. and Hanoi Rocks was like, you know, I could play that. Yeah. You know, I could get my head around that. That was, a, a, you know, um, it wasn't, you didn't have to be a virtuoso to do that. Yeah. You know? And so then all of a sudden in LA, all these bands, like, cause it, prior to that, I, you know, I was going to see like, um, you know, Keel and, and, um, and Malice and bands like that, yeah, you know, yeah. go, I was, had started going down to see shows in LA a lot and then whatever shows happened to come through Santa Barbara. But then like all these bands exploded all over LA, like uh, Poison and Guns N' Roses and sure. um, Faster Pussycat and Elegant. Uh, that whole thing was happening and that was like rock and roll. That was a lot closer to my Kiss records than it was to my, you know, crazy, uh, complicated heavy metal records. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I just then, that, I was like off to the races. You yeah. Know? What was your first band? First band I was ever in, well, the first time I ever jammed with anybody yeah. um, was in my friend's garage, and we just played a Dio song over and over for a couple hours, because that was I just knew that that riff, yeah. like Last in Line or whatever. Um, and uh, uh, But that wasn't really a band. So then in, uh, that was like, I think like eighth grade, but then ninth grade, we put a band together for my ninth grade talent show. Mm-hmm. And it was called The Lost Kittens. All right. And uh, we did two Kiss songs. We okay. did Strutter, and we did Rock and Roll All Night. Nice. And uh, my hair was like bigger than me. <laughs> you know, I doubled in size night? with my hair. For yeah. that night or in general at that time? Uh, in general, but definitely that <laughs> night, man. I got out my Aquanet Ultra Hold and made that made nice. that shit stick right up. Yeah. Yeah. And then, uh, did you, you know, I got a, There's a, 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 a sad thing happened to me that night because I have older brothers, and that's like the reason I'm into music. That's okay. the reason I play guitar. And my older oldest brother, Mike, is an amazing guitar player. Um, and he at that time had a 63 SG and like a late seventies strat. The strat was nothing special, but the 63 SG was yeah, know, amazing. And I borrowed those for my gig at the high school for my talent show. Okay. And for, I, to this day, don't understand why I did this, but I left him at the high school Oof. and somebody broke in and stole them both and we never got them back. Uh. And it was like just knife through the heart. I, I, you know. I wish we had like the serial numbers or something. I wish there's a way to like figure that yeah. out now and trace it to wherever it wound up. But somebody got my brother's guitars and it was a hundred percent my fault. How'd your brother take that? <laughs> he wasn't real pumped. <laughs> yeah. You know, my brother's a sweetheart and it's funny because when I had to go home and tell him and I was real scared and he was so sweet about it at the time because he could see how upset I was. But like, for the next 30 years, we, we yeah. uh, every time we got in an argument, he'd be like, and you got my guitar stolen. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Uh, so did you stay in Santa Barbara till how old were you? When did I you move to LA out? when I was 18, 18 for yeah. music? Yep. Yeah. That was the idea. I mean, I'm, uh, you know, went down there to like, you know, to make it. And, and what happened? Well, it's interesting because by the time I got to LA, that was like the beginning of 1990. Okay. Know? And, um, you know, the, like all those bands that I mentioned, they had all, you know, that scene had come and gone Yeah, and it was over. Yeah. You know, but that was still where my head was at. So when I moved to L.A., I was like expecting it to be like, you know, it's a, rock and roll was happening and rock and roll was fucking dead, man. And it was in that like pre grunge, pre alternative music, really, sort yeah. of, you know, like being a thing. Yeah. Um, and so it was a weird scene in L.A., man. Nobody was going to gigs. You know, the you would just play to like empty rooms. You know, mm-hmm. we would get gigs. You know, maybe you'd get a gig at like the No Bozo Jam at the Whiskey, and there'd be people there because there was like free tacos or whatever. It was like Got it. it was a weird scene. You know, it, it, the scene had just totally died, and um, and uh, and and I did that for a long time. You yeah. know, and then you know, just music scene was just changing, and you know, along the way through high school, I was getting into other stuff like punk rock and yeah, you know, Bad Religion and no effects and things like that, you know, were all happening. And um, so by about the mid 90s, after being in LA for, you know, five years or so, I moved up to San Francisco with my buddy Joey Cape, who sings in a band called Lagwagon. 
Yeah. And Lagwagon uh, was on a label called Fat Records. Yeah. It was owned by Fat Mike, you know, from No Effects. So Joey helped me get a, a job at, at Fat Records. Okay. Right? And so I worked there for a couple of weeks. And then this band called No Use for a Name came in. They were about to go on the road in a few days. And they came in. They were like, hey, you know, our guitar player just quit. Yeah. If anybody knows anybody, you know, <laughs> let us know. And I was like, oh, I wanted to raise my hand so bad. You yeah. Know? But I, I didn't want to fuck up my job. I'd just gotten the job there. Sure. And it was a good job, you know. Um, but Mike, actually, Fat Mike, uh, was like, dude, you should do it. You should yeah. go do that gig. So I got that gig and then went on tour. And, and that was like the first time I was ever in a band that, you know, had a little bit of a draw and, and, yeah. uh, and made records and, and did all that stuff. And then not too long after that, we put the Gimme Gimme's together and started doing that. Um, and I did that for, you know, about four and a half years. I was in no use. Yeah. Yeah. And were you, uh, did you, you, the transition from metal to kind of more punk based stuff was, was cool? Yeah. I mean, it wasn't like something that happened overnight. I mean, you yeah. know, when I was a kid in Santa Barbara, you know, there was, I was in a Hanoi Rocks, but nobody else was, yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? There wasn't like there was a scene there for it. Sure. So if you wanted to go out, you know, to a gig, it was always like a keg party and it was going to be a punk rock band or it was going to be a thrash metal band yeah it's pretty much the only two options you know yeah. for the most part um so you know you i just started getting exposed to stuff then um and play you know i was in punk bands here and there and yeah. you know th- uh, throughout high school and um so that was just sort of a slow progression but um yeah it was the joining no use that was was interesting because i didn't know him hmm. you know and I didn't really know their music until I joined the band. And that was kind of your first tour ever? Yeah. Yeah. And I only had a few days really to get ready for it. So okay. it was like, you know, just kind of learning on the fly. But it served me well because it was really the exact same situation as when I joined Foo Fighters. Yeah. I didn't know them. I mean, I knew Foo Fighters music, but sure. I never sat down and figured it out until I auditioned for them. Yeah. You know, but they were, were one of my favorite bands, you know, before I joined. So, but it was like, you know, it was the exact same situation as no use. Like I joined Foo Fighters and we left a few days later and I didn't know anybody. And I was just kind of like, whoa, you know, my head was just spinning. Yeah. You know? And how did that come about? The Foo Fighters gig? Um, there were I, auditions? Yeah, they, they had auditions and I, and I went and auditioned for them and, um, it was tricky because we had just made a brand new No Use for a Name record and it was about to come out. Yeah. We were about to go on tour and I, I, found, I got the call to go down and audition for Foo. I was living in San Francisco at the time. Yeah. So I went down to LA and I auditioned and it, you know, it seemed like it went well. It was cool, you know? And then I went home and just kind of went like, huh? And, um, and, and I couldn't tell my band, yeah. you know, because I didn't want to be like, Oh, you know, I'm, I audition for food. And then what if I didn't get the gig, you know? Um, that yeah. would be awkward. And, uh, and so then, and like the, the, the no use tour was just getting closer and closer. And then a week later, I got another call from the Foo Fighter camp. And they said, come back down, have another audition. And um, so that was like a longer yeah. jam. And then the next day they called me and said, you know, you, you got the gig. And so I called my band and, and quit. And I mean, by that time, it was like, it was just a few days out from Oof. leaving to go on tour. Painful and it was, so I kind of left them in the lurch. But, um, but like, they pretty much turned around and got a new guitar player within about 24 hours. Yeah. Uh, a guy named Dave Nassie, who played with them for years. Yeah. Um, so it all worked out. Yeah. 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 And is your guitar rig kind of evolving throughout all these years? Or are you kind of holding true oh, to it? Oh, big time. Yeah. You know, in, when I was, I, I always, you know, uh, it's funny. My older brother, once again, I just used his, he had a music man, okay. uh, full stack. I don't know why he bought this thing. He bought a music man full stack in the, in like the late seventies. Sure. And it was just sitting there in our house. Cause my brother, Mike is an amazing guitar player, but he wasn't really like a band guy. He didn't really go down that road. So he had this, this, uh, full stack and I would just use that, mm-hmm. um, all through high school, you know, cause I didn't have money to get a, to get a new amp or yeah. anything. And, um, and then eventually I got a job and I bought a, a Mesa Boogie, uh, it's either a Mark II or a Mark III. I still have it somewhere. Um, and I, that, and I, that was like the first amp I went and bought. You yeah. know, it was like, at that time, it was like I'd never heard a Mesa Boogie. Dude, that, that thing was screaming, yeah. you know, compared to the, to the Music Man. So the Music Man became my band's PA. Like when we would go play parties, we would sure. sing through it. And then I got uh, drunk one night in Isla Vista and I just left it at the party that we had played and I just never went back and got it. <laughs> like, I don't know what I was thinking. You know, it was like it's tw- 20 minutes from my mom's house. You know what I mean? I just left it there. I was like, ah, fuck that thing, you know? Um, so that was another piece of my brother's gear that I lost for yeah. no reason. Uh, 
And uh, but anyway, so I had that boogie, and I and I and I played that for years and years and years, and then eventually, somewhere along the lines, when I was in No Use, I got like a um, uh, what were those what were those ones that had like the metal grill on the front that everyone was playing in the mid '90s? What the fuck were they called? Uh, Mach Two or a Turbo? I don't remember. Yeah. It was it was like the one that yeah. everyone had, and I'm just drawing a blank. And so I had that. I think when I joined Foos. Um, but I tell you the biggest difference, the big change that I had to get used to in joining Foo Fighters was I never had pedals. Yeah. Ever. I never had pedals. I never fucked around with delays. I don't know why. Yeah. It was just something I completely missed um, my whole life. And when I joined Foo Fighters, there were songs that needed certain delays and certain mm-hmm. settings. And maybe you needed a flanger here or a chorus there or a phaser there. And so all of a sudden, I had a pedal board. You know, and then that was like, you know, coordinating. I remember just struggling. Just it's like, you know, it was like, you know, doing this, you know, like <laughs> doing that thing. Um, and just trying to get that down um, was was kind of difficult. And it's funny now because, I mean, I have by far the biggest pedal board in the band. I have like it's 100 million pedals and they uh-huh. make fun of me all the time for it. Yeah. And they call it like the spaceship or whatever. But um, yeah, I just somehow miss that but that was the biggest change you know? did you nerd out on the pedals or were you just kind of taking advice from what worked in the past I just, or yeah that? i just kind of went with the settings that you know dave sort of showed me the songs that needed this that and the other and, and yeah. how it should be set and i just kind of went with that um but um yeah uh i don't remember my rig changing that much for years i remember there was a point though and this was like way into being in the band like mm-hmm. like wasting light era yeah foo fighters where all of a sudden we went from all pretty much like having like just Mesa Boogie Road Kings or whatever on stage to I remember like the, the first rehearsal for that Wasting Light record and everybody showed up with like just weird new amps, you know? I mean, not weird, but like yeah. just different, you know, everybody. Yeah. And all of a sudden it changed, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So you're doing the Foo Fighters, you, and then what kind of sparked the, the sort of singer songwriter Americana country thing? Well, it again, you know, had been like slow progression over the years. It's just something I got into more and more. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd had a band called Jackson United that was more like a rock and roll thing. And then um, I just remember I'd written a bunch of songs that didn't sound like that, you know, that were mellower and more mm-hmm. sort of acoustic-y based. And I started recording them with my friend Lou, who runs the, he's like the uh, house engineer at Foo Fighters Studio okay. and a great drummer. Um and we just started sort of putting these songs together and it just didn't, it just wasn't, you know, it was something different. Yeah. And it was the first time I'd ever kind of messed around with something in that dynamic, you know? And yeah. It's a lot mellower, cleaner guitar tones, a lot of single coil, you know, Telecaster type of stuff on that record. And uh, pedal steel and keys and just, you know, sounds that I had loved for a long time but had never really sort of dipped my toe into. Um, and that became the, the first... Uh, Dead Peasants record. Yeah. Yeah. And were you kind of listening to like classic country at that point or was it more the kind of alt modern country, you know, it's the, all of the above, all you know, the, I yeah. mean, I, lo- I love all that stuff. I mean, I, I love the, you know, like Sunvolt, Wilco stuff. And yeah. Old 97s and all, all those bands love that stuff. Yeah. And, you know, I love my old Stones records. I mean, Stones are my favorite band ever and, and they're, you know, a lot of that stuff that they did is pretty like roots, you yeah. know, and I think, they're probably as big or a bigger influence on a lot of the modern stuff than even like the fucking Hank Williams or something, you know yeah, I mean? To me, those yeah. bands sound more like the stones than they do like Buck Owens, you know? Yeah. Um, but you know, I also over the years got, have gotten really into, you know, Buck and Merle and yeah, you know, Wynn Stewart and Ray Price and, and all those guys. So it's, it's an ongoing thing. Cause you know, I didn't grow up with it. You know, I didn't really get into that yeah. until I was a little bit older. And so it's, it's still, I always tell people I don't really listen to a lot of new music, you know, but it's all new to me Mm because I wasn't there, you know, and and when it when it was new, yeah, yeah. And did you uh, start to accumulate more country leaning guitars in this in this journey? (laughs) Oh yeah, (laughs) yeah, Yeah, absolutely. (laughs) Dreadnoughts and uh, Black or Telly, yeah, yeah, not so much that, but I did get some Tellys, you know. I mean, so my progression to the Telecaster was I uh, got. a Tele Deluxe that's like the one that my signature model is based off. Yeah. You know, and it's like a 72. It's got the wide range pickups in it. You know, it's, it's that one. Um, and it's, and it's, it's a little gentler, you know, not quite as heavy sounding of a guitar as mm-hmm. like a Les Paul or something like that. Yeah. And so that was, I never really played 
um, you, you know, I was like a Gibson guy. I only ever had a Les Paul growing up. That yeah. was like the only guitar I had. So that was just what I was used to. So that guitar, and this was years ago now, but that guitar was really my my entry point to Fenders. You know, and mm-hmm. it, like I always liked the way Fenders felt and everything, but I just never owned one. Yeah. So I got that one, and then it was then I just went crazy and started buying Strats and and Tellys and you know the real like single coil Tellys, yeah. you know, type setups. But it took a while to get used to that as far as playing because, you know, it's a very different, yeah. much more unforgiving mm-hmm. sound. You know, you can get away with a lot when you've got a lot of gain and volume, <laughs> you know. You can yeah. hide a lot, you know, and then you throw a delay pedal on it. Jesus, man, you, you're bulletproof. Yeah. And when you're up there playing, a, um, you know, a, a telly pretty clean through a deluxe, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, yeah. you hear those no, blunders, no you know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Where'd you find that guitar? Um, I, well, that, that Tele Deluxe, I traded, um, I actually traded an old Vespa that I had to, <laughs> to a guy that I knew for it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And we, you just were looking for that or it no, just was a good trade? it just trade. came my way. <laughs> yeah. It was just, I had this Vespa and he wanted it and he was like, Hey, I got this guitar. You want it? I was yeah. like, cool. Never, never had one of those before. Nice. Sign me up. Well, talk to me about the new record. Cause it sounds fantastic. Oh, I, right I on. truly love it. Yeah. So this new record, I made it out in Nashville with Dave Cobb producing. Yeah. Um, you know, he's, you probably know who he is. He's yeah. an amazing producer and he's done a lot of great records that I love yeah. over the years. So um, I knew with this record, I wanted to do something different. I wanted to work with, I never really had like a producer on my solo stuff, mm-hmm. you know, I'd always just kind of gone in and done it myself. And I knew that like, you know, I could get my songs to a certain place, but I wanted them to go a little further than that or a mm-hmm. lot further than that. And I just wanted to make a great record. I wanted to make a record I could be really super proud of. And I wanted um, to do it in a different environment with different people and, you know, just a whole different thing. And, and that's what I got. Yeah. Yeah. And did you, uh, you didn't record in the other, the other two in Nashville, did you? Or, no, yeah. no. I just did those at, um, at 606. Yeah. So did yeah. you, uh, did you try to tap into the local talent or? Well, I to, did, yeah. you know, cause I, I wasn't coming out there with a band and, and Cobb was like, don't worry about it, man. I got it. You know, <laughs> yeah. He's got, he's got a, a, a wrecking crew of his own, Yeah, you know, guys that he, um, works with a lot. And so I, I knew I was going to be in good hands cause yeah. you know, whoever he's, he was going to pick was going to be great, you know? Yeah. And, and they were, and you know, I got to meet all these cats that I didn't know and, and play with all these amazing people and, mm-hmm. and, and they had a huge impact on it, you know? And it was great because I didn't, having Dave Cobb produce it, like I didn't have to m- micromanage what was going on at all. Mm-hmm. You know, I didn't, I knew there was not one moment that I was like, can you change the kick drum pattern on that? Mm-hmm. I just like, I was focused cause we tracked everything live in the room, you know, the basic tracks like guitar, bass, yeah. but, well, two guitars, Dave would be on acoustic, I'd be on electric and then we'd have bass and drums going. And I was just trying to like make sure that I was playing my parts right and, and doing you know what I wanted there. So I just wasn't thinking about what the other folks were doing at all. And then like listening back to it, you're like, wow, goddamn, those guys are fucking amazing. <laughs> I made a country record. <laughs> totally, yeah. <laughs> the songs kind of you know listening to it like I could hear them in a variety of different settings. Like some of them sound like they'd be great if a punk three piece tried to play the the song. You know, right. like. Um, how are you writing them? Are you thinking in your head like pedal steel and, you know? It's not so much in the writing, you know? Yeah. Like, I mean, I would just sort of write them. I, you know, like I write everything just on an acoustic guitar, kind of sitting there with a notepad. And, yeah. Um, but I did a couple rounds of demos, um, even though Dave was like, don't do demos. <laughs> I don't like it when people do demos. Really? But I had to do demos. Okay. Because, you, know, you know, I had to make sure that I had songs, mm-hmm. you know, Makes, yeah. um, and you sort of never know that till you record it and listen back and you're like, okay, I think that, that could be all right. So I did, uh, my first round of demos was just really fast, just kind of blew through them, just an acoustic guitar and a vocal. Yeah. And then I, um, did another round of demos where I just like added a bunch of other instrumentation to it. Um, I mean, not a ton, but just, you know, I played drums and, sure. and threw a bunch of guitars and things like that. Just to see what it was. So, you know, by at, at that point, you know, I was starting to think like, oh, that one would be good with pedal steel, you know, yeah. solo. That'd be good with like pian- tinkly piano or whatever. Yeah. But it was interesting, you know, recording it because we did the basic tracks, then we started doing vocals. Um, and then we had, um, you know, a keyboardist come in and throw some keys on. I don't remember what the order was exactly, but you realize that like we don't have it's not all the same stuff on every song because like 
I didn't want it to be too heavily layered. Yeah. And once once we got to that point where we were putting the keys and the and the steel on there, you, know, you just sort of realized that some songs were already they just had enough. Yeah. You know, there was just there was already plenty of shit swirling around on them. We just didn't need anything else. You yeah. Know? Yeah. It's got to be tricky in Nashville where there's like a world class mandolin player sitting next to you. You're oh. like, no, go away. <laughs> yeah. What's that? There's that Vince Gill quote like the guy parking your car is a better guitar player than you are. <laughs> you know, it's true out there, yeah. man. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's a, it's, I mean, that's the amazing thing about Nashville to me. It's like, you know, it, it's a music town. Yeah. It's just through and through, you know, and it's like you have all these different things. There's obviously the mainstream, sort of dominated by the mainstream country music thing. But then there's all that, like, East Nashville stuff. And mm-hmm. there's all the, and there's a full, like, rock and roll indie scene and Everyone's everything in there. between, like, old yeah. bluegrass dudes and the class country guys. And there's just, like, it's, it's all, happening there all the time yeah you, know? you have pangs of wanting to move there i i mean i love it out there and I, I could definitely spend more time out there but i would go fucking nuts if i was that far from the beach <laughs> <laughs> i don't think i could handle it for too long Fair when, point. when they put a kelly slater wave pool in downtown nashville i'm there all right cool yeah, yeah. so let's talk a little bit about your podcast because it's amazing oh thank you yeah walking the line and it, it's um I mean, talk to me about the origin of it. What were you thinking? Well, it started, you know, I did a, a, a covers record a few years ago. Yeah. And um, when I did that, the, well, one of the guys from my label, Joe, who's one of the owners, um, said, like, you should make a podcast. Because you could use the podcast to, like, you know, promote your record. You know, yeah. It'd be cool. I was like, okay, cool. And then I was like, well, what would my podcast be? Mm-hmm. What do you do? You know? And, um, and I swear, I just bit the format of Mark Maron's podcast. Sure, <laughs> I just didn't, sure. I was like, I don't know. Because at the time, that was the only one that I knew and listened to. Sure. Um, so I just kind of uh, just did the same thing. And and, uh, and I realized pretty quickly how much I enjoy doing the interviews. You know, it's mm-hmm. really fun. And it's a great way to just get to meet some of these cool artists and talk to them and, you know, yeah, pick their brains about stuff. And it's like different. There's some of them, you know, I've, I've gotten to, to interview some people that I grew up listening to you know yeah and just at and ask them all the questions you ever kind of wondered when you're a kid sitting there staring at their record sleeve you know yeah and then there's people you know like merle haggard and you know get to hang with that dude and see what he's you know he blew me away he was just so freaking yeah. cool and welcoming and 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 nice you know i expected him to be like grumpy and like what the <laughs> fuck do you want and he was just the exact opposite you know yeah, yeah. um so it's been fun man it's been it's it's been good, you know. This this last year has been um, has been incredible with it, you know, because I had a lot of time off last year, especially at the beginning of the year. You know, okay. I didn't have anything going on, and I was just doing interview after interview after interview. Went out to Nashville at one point for a few days and was just doing tons of interviews, and it was great, man. And you have people come to your house or your studio, or sometimes what? I've done yeah. them in my house, I've done them in my studio, I've done them in people's hotel rooms, I've done them in you know people's tour buses. Yeah, basically all you need uh, is a couple of mics, a little digital interface, sure. and a laptop. And I can if I I got that and I just take it anywhere, you know. Yeah, I even actually on this trip that I'm on um, because I'm I'm trying to keep it on the weekly schedule yeah. i brought I, I bought a little pelican case you know like one of those uh-huh. small pelican cases and i've got uh one of these mics yeah i got my little digital interface a mic cable and my hard drive in there okay it's totally portable nice yeah it's awesome and yeah. so you're trying to do weekly or you are doing weekly yeah yeah, yeah. i was um, doing it every other week and what happened was i got so backlogged with interviews that they were all getting kind of dusty yeah and so i figured i got to bump it up to every week so do you use tours to kind of like go oh who's in spokane i could talk to or i should if i was that on top of it i would totally do that and that is kind of my dream like when foos are back out on the road and like doing festivals yeah you know if i could just grab people yeah um the problem with that is like you know a lot of people um when you're on tour and i get it because i'm you know i i do it too but like you know if you're working, you don't really want to do like an extra sure, but you round it, you know, an yeah. extra long interview, you know, when you're like, want to just drink a beer at a festival and hang out with your friends or whatever, like, yeah. you know, so we'll see. But that is kind of like, I've done that a little bit here and there, but, but I, I should do it more. If I was really on top of it, I'd do that a lot more. Yeah. You've done such a cool array too of like, you know, a lot of people we cover like Sarah DeRose and Marty oh, Stewart cool. and then yeah. Red oh, Simpson, Stewart, you know, yeah. it's like you've, you've gone back. It's yeah. cool. Yeah. 
Red was one of the first ones I did, man. That was a funny one because I did not have my interview chops together at all. Okay. And he was like, he was a funny dude. You know, he was a, an old man by the time I interviewed him. Where where did you interview him? I interviewed him at his house. Okay. Up in Bakersfield. Okay. Um, and I walked in and I started setting up and he was like, so uh, what radio station are you from? <laughs> I was like, uh-oh. <laughs> I don't think Red knew what a podcast was, and I don't God think, bless him, you know? I don't think half of our readers care about podcasts right. either, but yeah. yeah, well, we do it anyways. Yeah. I love podcasts, man. Nowadays, it's almost all I listen to. I mean, I live in LA, so you're where in the you're car. always in your car, <laughs> yeah. and podcasts, it's like it's like a um, TiVo for the radio almost, you know? Yeah. Like, if you could TiVo your radio, it's like that, you know? Yeah. Because every time I get in my car, it just starts where I left off. Yeah. Love it. Do you cram before the interviews or do you just try to kind of have a conversation? I yeah. mean, I, I like to be prepared. I like to yeah. do some research, especially if it's somebody I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's if it's somebody you know then, then you, and are a huge fan of, then you sort of know the arc of their career. Yeah. But, um, but that, that is one of the best things about doing it now is because I sort of cycled through all the people in my phone book. You know what I mean? Like yeah, I'm yeah. through all that. So now we've, in the last year, we, we've gotten to know like, you know, all the publicists that yeah. you know, handle all the people we want to try to get to. And so we've been interviewing or I've been interviewing a lot of people who, uh, whose work I wasn't really familiar with prior oh, cool. to doing the interview. So it's turned me on to loads of great music like Aaron Lee Tajian, yeah. you know, people like that, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah, lots of, lots of good stuff. Have you gotten any kernels of wisdom from the classic country guys that have mm. affected your recordings? I'll tell you what, there's a couple things I've noticed about the old, the old timers. Okay. Two things. First off, they don't give a fuck about their gear. They yeah. are not nostalgic. They don't sit there and go, ooh, I got a 59, whatever. It is. Like, you know what I mean? They yeah. just used the shit that was new at the time. And that's why you always see old guys using like a, you know, lame new shit. Yeah. <laughs> Probably because yeah. they're like, the I just want the new thing. TV, yeah. But they, yeah. the most, almost to a man, most of the, the old timers I've interviewed are not all nostalgic about, about vintage gear the way like we are. Sure. You know? Um, so that's one little thing. I've also noticed, and this is like old, young, it doesn't matter. Almost nobody can really articulate how they write a song. Yeah. Because it's, it's just it's kind of a mysterious thing that people, even if like you are one of those people, and not many of them that like get up and, you know, yeah. are super disciplined about it every day. Um, it's still a mystery, you yeah. know, how that works exactly. So how do you write a song? <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I've got it all figured out yeah. thanks to my podcast. No, it's, you know... I I wish that uh, that I was more disciplined. I mean, I hear that when I interview people. Yeah, well, probably more than anything else, you know. But um, but uh, I write. I'll, I'll, I just sort of scribble shit down when I'm inspired. Yeah. Um, you know, if I'm really on top of it, I might be just jotting things down in my in my notebook, like over a cup of coffee, right when I get out of bed. That's yeah. a good time. Yeah. Um, then it's just like, then it's just work, you yeah. know. I mean, the writing the, my new record, I, I booked the date when I didn't have my songs really ready to go. I had some, you really? know, but I didn't have an album's worth, you know? Okay. So then I, then I booked the date and then I got to work, you know? I just went in every day and I wrote and I wrote and I wrote and I tend to write too much and then pare it down and yeah. um, and that's kind of how I do it. And then it was great because I went to Nashville with with a surplus of songs mm -hmm. and, and didn't have to be stressed about it. And I wasn't in there like, you know, Oh fuck, I got to finish. Oh, this mm -hmm. sucks. I got, you know, it was good. Yeah. It was a good feeling. What'd you take in? What'd you drive, take to Nashville, the, the 72 telly or the, no, no, I took a few things and didn't use any of them. Except okay. I, I mean, I, well, actually that's not true. I have one guitar out with me right now. I mean, Dave Cobb has such a ridiculous collection of gear okay. that I didn't need to bring anything, Okay, but there is a, 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 a 68 non reverse firebird that I have that has P nineties in it that, okay. um, that I used a lot. I also used a couple of, he has a, an old 53 Tele and a 63 Esquire. Okay. And I used those a lot. I used that 63 Esquire so much that he actually sold it to me <laughs> at the end of, <laughs> nice. of making that record. Nice. Um, but you got to understand with that dude, um, he's an expensive hang because Dave wants to go to the, um, to the vintage guitar stores every single day. And wow. look at guitars. So like you like by when I got back from Nashville, I was like totally in that mindset. <laughs> like, man, I need to get one of those and I need to get one of those, you know. So um yeah, uh that was that was very tempting. Yeah, between Carter Vintage and Carter Groons. Vintage. We we went to Carter Vintage more than anything else, but we went to Groons too. It's kind of like the Home Depot of vintage guitar stores, totally. everything you would ever yeah. want. 
and they're so damn nice. They are. Well, sure. You're like, fuck, I need this thing, man. <laughs> the salesman's so friendly. <laughs> it's that Southern hospitality. <laughs> totally, man. And that Southern food, man. Oof. All right. Thanks so much for being on the podcast, mm. man. Thanks for having me. That was fun. <laughs>